How does Rome influence the other religions? Is there some way of identifying a connection between Islam and Rome or Hinduism and Rome, Buddhism, Judaism for that matter, and Rome? Well, this is what we're looking at at the moment. And you'll remember in the first section of this lecture, we went into how do secret organizations work? Because Theology 101 told us that in every religion, you have an exoteric and an esoteric section. In other words, within Christianity, within Buddhism, within Judaism, within all of them, you've got a group of people that are the masses, the people, the members of the congregation, if you like, that know a certain amount of information. And then you have a group of individuals in the inner core that know uh, what, what information is not supposed to be dispersed amongst the people. And when we went into Freemasonry and to certain secret societies, we realized that the same idea is kept. Morals and Dogma told us by Albert Pike that the Templars created two religions, one inside a hidden one called uh, uh, Johannism, and one outsider one which is known as Roman Catholicism. And that's why today you haven't heard probably about Johannism before. But we all have heard of Roman Catholicism. And Roman Catholicism today encircles the globe with over a billion adherents. Well, this is the question. How does Rome then influence other religions? Is there some way of connecting them? Well, here's an image of Mecca. Islam, along with certain of the other religions, is a religion which has pilgrimages. These people spend their life savings on going to Mecca, going to their holy city, and spending time worshipping at the holy shrines. Interestingly though, in all pagan religions, pilgrimages are the order of the day. And amazingly enough, that's exactly what you find in Roman Catholicism. Pilgrimages to the Catholic Vatican or pilgrimages to here, pilgrimages to there, pilgrimages to the visions and the images given at La Salette, etc. Pilgrimages are part of a, a, a pagan understanding of going somewhere to receive a certain blessing. And this is in contradiction to the Christian understanding where Jesus is where you are as long as you ask him to come into your life. Again, the same sort of image just shows the millions upon millions upon millions of these people involved in a religion which we're going to have to look into in the next couple of minutes. In AD 661, this area here around North Africa was the only area that Islam was really to be noticed. Today, if we look at the area which Islam covers, it's a pretty vast area, covering from, from the uh, halfway through Russia, if you like, almost into China, and across the entire North Africa. Well, Muhammad married Khadija, who was, interestingly enough, a Roman Catholic. And when he was 25 and she was about 40, her cousin, by the name of Waraka, was also a Roman Catholic. And as AnyCities.com explains and many other sources, Muhammad Mustafa was born in 570 AD and died in 632 AD. He fled Medina in 622 AD after Khadija's death. So his wife dies and he flees Medina. He marched on Mecca in 630 AD, two years before he died and four years before Omar became the caliph. Now the Quran was compiled in 650 AD. So this Mohammedan character, this, the prophet by which the Muslims um, follow or the prophet that the Muslims follow was somehow associated with, if you like, Roman Catholicism. His wife was a devout Roman Catholic. Let's have a look what Robert A. Moray says about Allah. Allah. He was the moon god who married the sun goddess. Together they reproduced three goddesses who were called the daughters of Allah. These three goddesses were called Alat, al Uzza, and Manat. The Encyclopedia of Religion mentions that Allah is a pre-Islamic name corresponding to the Babylonian bell. Interesting 
to see from history, just analyzing who's in control of this religion, they'll tell us, Robert A. Mori in Islam Unveiled and various encyclopedias tell us that Allah is the moon god and he married the sun goddess. This is the, again the coming together of the sun and the moon. This is again a fulfillment, as you'll see just now, of the, the circle with the crescent moon, what we saw in previous lectures as the Baal Hadad. Well, this type of idea of sun worship, that I, I, is this possible where the entire Islamic movement is involved in sun worship? Well, Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike explains that the crescent and disc combined always represents the conjunctive sun and the moon. So here you have this circle or sun being a star, a circle or a star in a crescent moon representing the sun and the moon. Well, you just have to look at the symbol for Islam to realize that this is exactly what is the case. Islam on its own points towards the worshipping of the sun and the moon. This is just a different way of marketing, possibly. The sun worship system which Satan set up already in ancient days. Well, remember this picture, the solar deity known as Baal Hadad, where this image on top shows the Assyrian-style relief, where they are worshipping this Baal Hadad, this sun symbol, this circle or star within the half moon. Let's go for a moment back into history and look as we did in the previous lecture. What was it like in Egypt? Well, there you have on the right hand side the all-seeing eye with the Baal Hadad above it. Another relief from those ancient times, one of the ancient symbols of religious worship was the sun symbol where these two winged uh, entities have got their hands up and are worshiping, worshiping the sun. Interesting also to see that the sun has got straight rays and bent rays, exactly as we saw in the Anglican Cathedral and also in Roman Catholicism. Always, however, this circle or this star within the crescent moon, representing sun worship. This is a perfect example. You could almost, in fact, take that image of those two people with the wings worshipping the sun and you could transfer that to become the symbol of Islam. This symbol comes through Catholicism as well. You'll remember that John Paul here holding the Eucharist, once he's finished with it, he places it in the monstrance. And the monstrance is that sun or the solar disk that has got the crescent moon inside it. There are two monstrances as an example. And again, you'll see on the left, you'll see the straight and the bent sun rays with the crescent moon in the middle. There's even a church in Europe this is just one example where the Baal Hadad is on the arms of the clock. And every time you would have an hour completed, it would do the Baal Hadad. Baal Hadad, the birth and the death of the sun and the moon god. The sun dying into the womb and being reborn out of the womb. This is the reincarnative process of the sun and the moon. In Roman Catholicism, you've got Mary depicted inside this semicircle. She's also known as the Queen of Heaven or the Star of Heaven. So just that alone, is that possible? Well, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's walk into an Islamic mosque. As you are about to approach the mosque or as you're approaching about to enter, you stop and you have a look. And what do you see above the temple? That exact same symbol. That Baal Hadad, the circle within the crescent moon. And then as you enter, you walk over these lush carpets and you look up at the ceiling and there above you is a sun symbol, almost exactly the same as what we had seen in, in uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Let's stop for a moment and just think about this. One of the main things that was explained in Freemasonry was the so-called generative principle, this idea of the sun being the power behind the generative principle. And that being depicted in the, the compass and the set square with the G in the middle. Well, the generative principle along with sun worship comes from ancient pagan rites of phallic worship or what they called sex worship at the time. Now, obviously, the masses don't know about this and I don't expect you to have heard about this, but this is what it was about. One of the places where this was seen in ancient times was a place called Luxor. And this is the, an image of the ancient Luxor temple. 
I was going to use more images, but uh, looking at the slides that I had available, I decided to remove them because the images are so graphic of the phallus, the use of the phallus and these sexual intercourse pictures that are depicted in this temple. They're so graphic that I decided not to use them. Luxor Temple was a place where this pagan rite of phallic worship was practiced. As a Christian, I would assume today that we wouldn't want to really be part of that. That would be something that would maybe let our, the hairs on our back stand up. We would know that something's wrong. And as a Christian, we never mind wouldn't want to be associated. We certainly wouldn't want to build our church nearby. Well, let's walk for a moment into the Luxor Temple in front. The first thing that you'll notice on the left as you walk in is this mighty obelisk, the sun symbol of phallic worship. Then you walk towards the middle. As you walk a bit further, you see there's something at the back there. Can you see something sticking out between those two statues? What is that? Well, let's go around the side and have a look. Here's another image. Do you see what that is? That is a temple for Islam. That is a Muslim temple inside or even built inside the phallic system of worship, the temple of Luxor or the Luxor temple. I decided to add one or two extra in just to make sure this was the case. Looking back now towards the entrance of the temple, you not only see the phallus or the sun symbol, the obelisk, you see the temple and the steeples as well. And you see on top of it there, the Baal Hadad. How does this work? Is the the insider esoteric group running Islam, are they aware of this? Well, they must be because their symbols are the same. Their churches are built in the ancient sex worship temples. Obviously, this isn't known by the, by the masses and the people on the ground. It's a very hard subject to cover, this explanation of how these secret religions have infiltrated, because many of my Muslim friends are the most wonderful, kind-hearted people I've ever met. Muslims are devout in their belief. They are often of the most sincere people, the most punctual when it comes to meetings, the most reliable, trustworthy people on earth. And to have to go and explain to them, excuse me, the system in which you find yourself worships the sun and the moon, Allah being the moon god, is exactly the same as the right eye or the left eye, the male or the female, the, the combination of both through the gener generative principle, etc., etc. This comes from ancient rites. It wasn't new when given to Muhammad. Let's stop for a moment in Freemasonry. How does Freemasonry involve itself in this Islamic worship? Is it possible? Well, James Shaw was a 33-degree Freemason. He was actually a 32nd-degree Freemason, and then he was invited in to become a Shriner 33-degree Freemason. Remembering that the shrine of Freemasonry is in opposition to the sanctuary or the temple of God, the shrine pointing east and the sanctuary pointing west, to become a Shriner Freemason, you obviously have to point your worship to the east. Now, this James Shaw was a Christian at the time when he came to realize that he was actually busy with what he was actually busy with. And during his 33 degree Freemasonry initiation or the ceremony, there were certain people that came in attendance. One of the people that was watching or that was part of the ceremony in the audience of the ceremony was a certain gentleman by the name of Billy Graham. Being Part of an audience of a 33 degree Freemasonry ceremony? Well, you can only be a 33 degree Freemason if you are part of the audience. No one of the lower orders is allowed to be there. James Shaw wrote the book, The Deadly Deception, and he tried to explain that this was the case, that Billy Graham was at his ceremony, but he couldn't get his work published. And it was only till he changed the words, Billy Graham was in attendance, to there was a prominent evangelist in attendance that his book became published. And today it's freely available. You can go and pick it up from the bookstore, from Amazon. You can have a look. The Deadly Deception by James D. Shaw. Well, let's look into this book. What happens in a 33-degree Freemasonry ceremony? The 33rd-degree initiation ceremony, the oath is sealed by drinking wine out of a human skull. 
May this wine I now drink become a deadly poison to me as the hemlock juice drunk by Socrates, should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. A member dressed as a skeleton places his arms around the candidate who then states, and may these cold arms forever encircle me should I ever knowingly or willingly violate the same. This is the ceremony which is done to to initiate a person into the 33rd degree, saying that if I was to violate this oath, may my death be done by poison, or like the hemlock that Socrates drank, or may death encircle me. So this is a, an oath to death, an oath of secrecy. He continues and he says, Each of us was presented, along with a Scottish Rite ring, a copy of Albert Pike's book, Moral and Dogma. We were told that it was the source book of Freemasonry and, that, and its meaning. We were also told that it must never leave our possession and that arrangements must be made so that upon our deaths it would be returned to the Scottish Rite. When did James Shaw receive morals and dogma? When he became a 33 degree Freemason. He was at the 32nd level and he still hadn't received this book. Only once he was invited to become a 33 degree Shrine of Freemason was he able to read this book, Morals and Dogma. And it was only at that point that he was told, this is the source book of all Freemasonry. And you're not allowed to uh, pass it through the family upon your death. On your death, it goes back into the system. The Scottish Rite includes 29 degrees, he explains. Well, those are beyond the first three degrees, beyond the Blue Lodge. Master Mason being that third degree, thinking, oh, I'm a master Freemason. Well, you've got 29 degrees to go till you find out what's going on. He says that the York Rite has the equivalent of 29 degrees of the Scottish Rite and the advancement upon this path culminates, listen here, in the degree Knight Templar. In addition, the Shrine, which is the ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic Shrine, is available to the 32nd degree Masons and Knights Templars who wish to participate. So as you work your way through Freemasonry, when you get to the top, you become part of the Knights Templar, orientation and do you remember what they believed they were, the, they were the ones that spat on the cross they the, were the ones that set up the system of secret insider johannism and public goyim catholicism well not only did he, can you become a knight templar but at the 33rd degree you, you are invited to become a shriner mason the shrine, he says, which is the ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine. He says the shrine, the show army of masonry, maintains a very high profile. It is necessary to be a 32nd degree Freemason for six months before being eligible to join the shrine. Now listen what happens in the ceremony. That's the background. Now he's going through the ceremony and he's a Christian and he now bows down for the ceremony. Read with me what it says. With the Quran on the altar, we sealed our solemn oath in the name of Allah, the God of the Arab, Muslim, and Mohammedan, the God of our fathers. Isn't that amazing? At the 33rd degree, they seal their oath on the Quran. Up to there, any of the religious books is suitable, but at the top, the Quran is the book on which they seal the faith. He says, every shriner near, kneeling before the Quran takes this oath in the name of Allah and acknowledges this pagan god of vengeance as his own. And in the ritual, he acknowledges Islam, the declared blood enemy of Christianity, as the one true path. How does Islam at the top in the shrine of Freemasonry, how does it link together? Well, let's just go inside the temple and have a look at the Shriner Freemasons themselves. Let's look at the cap they put on, the Shriner hat. Well, here you have a depiction of it, of what's written on it is Mosla, Muslim Allah, the God of Freemasonry according to Allah, according to uh, Albert Pike in our first half of this lecture. He said, Lucifer, he is the God of Freemasonry. Now when you become a 33rd degree Freemason, you bow down and you seal your oath on the Quran, which is obviously Allah being the God. So what does Albert Pike say about this word Allah or Yahweh reversed? Let's find out. He says in page 102 of Morals and Dogma, the true name of Satan, the Kabbalists say, is Yahweh or God reversed. 
So in typical fashion, just like they turn the cross upside down, they take the name of God, Yahweh, which is a biblical name, and they turn it upside down. They fiddle with it and they, they invert it. Well, let's have a look at this. If you take the name of God, Yahweh, in the original writing, it is written like that. If you turn it inside out in reverse writing, you write it like that. You turn it upside down in occult fashion, you squeeze it all together, and amazingly enough, in Arabic, that spells Allah. In perfect symmetry with the Bible saying, don't get involved in things which are to do with sun worship, where Allah is the sun and he marries the moon goddess. And in perfect symmetry with uh, Albert Pike that says that Allah is, or the God of, of uh, Freemasonry being Satan, his name is Allah when you seal your oath on the, on, the, um, on the altar as a 33 degree Freemason. This is the inversion of the biblical Yahweh. And it was only at that point that James Shaw came to realize what he was really busy with. Manny Palmer Hall explains in his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, he says, when the mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mastery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply the energy. See, this is where once you become a 33 degree Freemason and you understand that Allah is Lucifer, and you understand that Lucifer is the God of Freemasonry, and that he, by having acknowledged him as God, you become able to channel this energy. It's only at that point that you realize what you're really busy with. And this would all be funny ha-ha if it weren't that the top people in the world belong to the system. I'll get into some presidents in later lectures. I'll show you who are some of the presidents that are 33 degree Freemasons. This is an image here of a, a lodge meeting in Cairo in 1940 in Egypt. This is under the portrait of King Farouk I. Here's even the President Gamal Abdul Nasser, 1954 to 1970, and Muhammad Anwar Sadat from 1970 onwards to 1981. They were all members of this order of Shriner Freemasons. These people understand that the seething power of Lucifer now runs through their hands and through their bones, and they've got to work with this energy. This is a judge, Rageb Idris, who's a 33-degree Freemason, a Grand Master Sovereign and Commander of Egypt. The, he runs the entire system there. And there's his fez, once again, the, 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 the Shriner hat at least, with the symbol of Allah on it. The symbol of Islam the sun and the moon. And it doesn't matter if the symbol is with a star on top or with the star at the bottom. That's the right eye, left eye, male, female, good, evil. That's the God, which is not our biblical God. That is a God of this planet, the, the ruler of this planet, Lucifer, or now as we know him, Satan. Going back into ancient times, into Genesis 11, we have a look at Babel. I mentioned it in the earlier lecture, and I'll give you the quotations now from the Freemasons themselves. William O. Patterson, he's the editor of the Masonic quiz book. He says, or he asks in the quiz book, who was Nimrod? He answered it, he says, one of the founders of Masonry, Nimrod was a Mason himself. And then Arthur Edward White explains that as regards Masonry, Babel, of course, represented a Masonic enterprise. When they reached an abiding place in the land of Shinar, it is affirmed that they dwelt therein. It was here that they built their high tower of confusion. Out of evil comes good, however, and the confusion of tongues gave rise to the ancient practice of masons, listen now, conversing without the use of speech. You see, this is where they start to explain why they use symbols. Masons here are saying, well, the reason we have to use symbols goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel because we were trying to unify the world, one power, one world, one nation, one language, and at the same time we would rise up towards Godhood through this spirally system, this Tower of Babel, which became known as the, Babel, the Tower of Confusion. That got up God's nose because it was in contradiction to what he was doing. 
what he was planning. And he said, cluck. And from that point on, there were only the religion or only the languages available as what God had said. From that moment on, a person working with another colleague, all of a sudden they could no longer converse. And thousands of years, this has confounded all Satan-driven or satanic or Luciferian doctrines. This must have really upset Satan. And he swore from that moment on, we will no longer be using speech to communicate. We will now use symbols. We will use hand signals. We will, you'll see it in the badges we wear. You'll see it in the symbols of our companies, which I'll go into, into the lecture, the battle for the mind. So according to masonry, the Tower of Babel represented the first Masonic enterprise. And you just have to look at various of these images of the Tower of Babel to realize that it's, it's commonly understood that it was a type of spiral or a pyramid-shaped entity, this Tower of Babel. Let's go for a moment into an Islamic country and have a look what we see there. Here is an image from a spiral in Lebanon. And on top of that spiral is Mary. If I go to this image, this is an image from South Africa. Next to the highway as you're driving in Johannesburg and you reach the prob possibly the most important intersection in all of South Africa. Hundreds of thousands of cars passing by there every day. You see on your left as you're traveling north a sp big spiral and on top of the spiral Mary. This is both in Christian countries and in Muslim countries a representation of the completion of the spiral, the fulfillment or the God of that spiral system. This image shows Scott Hahn with a dot in the circle, again pointing towards this phallic symbol of sex worship. He says, Hail Holy Queen. This is the queening of Mary and the queen again having the dot in the circle. There are a couple of other people that we have to look at besides Albert Pike himself. If you want to understand who is also running along with these ideologies of Lucifer being the true God, we must look right at the top of these systems. And at the top you get Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. You get Alice A. Bailey. She founded the, the publishing company called Lucifer Trust. She got a bit of heat about it, so she changed it to Lucis publishing house or Lucis Trust and that is the publishing house that now today publishes all the United Nations documents. Lucifer Publishing? Well, we'll look into that a bit later. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, she says, mankind causes the daily and hourly fall of the sin of the celestial virgin, which thus becoming the mother of gods and devils at one and the same time, for she is the ever-loving beneficent deity to all those who stir her soul and heart. But in antiquity and reality, Lucifer is the name of the angelic entity presiding over the light of the truth as over the light of the day. So who's Mary, according to Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society? Who is Mary? Well, she says it's the male-female God. It's Mary in the form of the celestial virgin, the mother of gods who actually in actual fact is Lucifer, the name of the angelic entity presiding over light. She also says in her book Secret Doctrines on page 513, Lucifer is the divine and ter terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one at the same time. He can be the good guy and the bad guy. He can be the male, he can be the female, he can be the right eye, he can be the left eye. It's all the same thing, just in a different form. And here in an Islamic country, you've got Mary on top of the spiral. How does that work? Well, you see, in Egypt, if you go back into Egyptian times, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky explains that in her book Isis Unveiled, that the Egyptian litany, or the, the goddess of the Egyptian religions at the time, was a lady known by the name Holy Isis. She was known as the Universal Mother the mother of gods. She was also known as the queen of heaven or the virgin mother. Does that sound familiar? The virgin mother, queen of heaven? Well, Isis from ancient Egypt, according to Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who was right up there with Albert Pike, she says, 
it's the same thing. What you are worshipping as a Catholic is the same uh, in, the, in the form of Mother Mary, is the same as what we were wor worshipping as Holy Isis in ancient pagan days. This is the Virgin Mother, the Queen of Heaven. In, Cath in Catholicism today, she's known as the Mother of Gods, the Holy Mary, Virgin of Virgins, Queen of Heaven. It's one and the same thing. It's just a different way of marketing this lie. We see images of the Holy Ghost descending upon Mary or Jesus putting the, throne, the, the crown of thorns onto Mary and Mary the one with the holes in her hands. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky says in Isis Unveiled on page 41 that Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, and I must just explain who, what Alexandria is. This is the seat of paganism. This is like the main library, the place where they had all the doctrines of paganism and what we now would identify as Luciferian worship. This is the place that they had the seat of this doc, doc, the, the doctrines of that time. Alexandra. Cyril, who was the bishop of Alexandria, in other words, the pope of that area at the time, if you like, he openly embraced the cause of Isis, who was the Egyptian goddess, and had anthropomorphized her into Mary, the mother of God, and the Trinitarian controversy had taken place. So the, the bishop of Alexandra anthropomorphized, he made human Isis, who became Mary. So today when people are bowing down and lighting candles to Mary in Roman Catholicism, they don't know that they are part of an outsider, an exoteric teaching, which actually on the insider esoteric teaching is Johannism, which is based in Luciferianism, which is only known by the insider adepts. And those millions of people that are paying their way by having saved their whole lives to get to Mecca, they're involved in sun worship. This image from uh, Islam or from an Islamic country says, Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of all. The Marian apparitions plan to unite all religions under the Roman Catholic Church. This is common knowledge at the top, but it's not common knowledge at the bottom. 1 John 2 verse 22 says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. This is a statement in the Bible saying, who doesn't believe that Jesus died for you, who, he who that doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, he has the Spirit or he is Antichrist. Let's look into the Quran for a moment and see there that it says, Christ was altogether saved from the indignity of the cross. It says in verse 157, But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but it was made to appear to them for surety they killed him not. Let's have a look at another quote. God is indignant if Christ is believed to be God himself. Christ is not even the Son of God. The Quran removes Jesus Christ from being Jesus Christ. He removes Jesus Christ from being the one that is your only way of getting to heaven. And yet, as you can see in this image, the Pope kisses the Quran. You see, this is how you start to identify the finger in the pie. This is the moment when you can realize that something's going on here. Why would, if the Quran says that, why would the papacy accept, acknowledge, and kiss the Quran as if it is the holy book? If it's not by understanding that the God that they are worshipping, Mary, is the same as the, the God that they are worshipping, Islam is the same God, Lucifer being the male type of Mary being the female type, that's the only way that the two come together, that the papacy who worships supposedly Jesus Christ and Mary is able to acknowledge the Quran. That's the only place that they can come together. This letter is written by Pope John Paul and he addressed it to my beloved Muslim brothers and sisters. He calls them part of his family. It says, I close my greeting to you with the words, we believe in and confess one God, admittedly in a different way, and daily praise and venerate him, the creator of the world and the ruler of this world. Who's the ruler of this world? Well, it's certainly not Jesus Christ, the prince of darkness, the ruler of this world, according to uh, various things you just look around you and who's in control at the moment? Well, 
I disagree with the Pope when he says we believe and confess one God. We certainly don't. He, he's correct, he does, because in the female form or in the male form, the way they split apart is actually the same thing. This newspaper article shows an image of Pope Benedict. Muslims are hopeful despite new Pope's past writings. It says there, evangelism is not always active witnessing. But there is always that open-ended invitation. I'm uncomfortable sitting down with Muslims and actively trying to convert them. That's unfair. But if I share the good news as I understand it and someone accepts it, well, that's an unintended consequence. Evangelism is not active witnessing. Are we not supposed to go and teach all nations, baptizing in them in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Are we not supposed to create disciples and wake people up out of the slumber as they did in Ephesus? It continues and it says, we will come to the dialogue table with Muslims, now listen to this, to talk about everything but one thing, belief in Jesus Christ as the one truth. Who's writing this? You see today, all we have to do is look into history and say, Please have a look at, uh, just as an example, USA Today, 25th of September 2006. The Pope meets with these Muslim brothers and sisters. Now, if everybody was on an equal footing, they would all be dressed as you and I are, as anybody is, but you'll see in this image that everybody comes dressed in the dark colors. And there in the middle, in the center, raised up off the floor, sits the Pope on a special chair. He's the boss. And although he might make noises that seem to appear as if he is somehow condemning or, or infuriating the Muslims, this is an act, this is a plan, a way of inciting the Hegelian principle. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. MSNBC explains, the Pope prays during a visit to Istanbul Mosque. As he's traveling around, he has the right, as it is part of the same religion, to bow and pray in the same area as what devout Muslims are doing. Inside, this is the same religion. This is the same religion. You can see it in the symbols. You can see it in the way they do it. And you can see it in the way he says we worship and we confess one God. The God of Catholicism, insider Johannism, is the same God of the insider Islam people. What about Hinduism? Can we somehow find and trace a root of Hinduism back to Rome? Well, this quote from hinduwisdom.info explains a lot. It says, Hindus worship the nameless and formless supreme reality, Brahm. By various names and forms, these different aspects of one reality are symbolized by the many gods and goddesses of Hinduism. In no other religion does the supreme being wear so many masks and invite worship in so many different forms as the eternal religion of Hinduism. When they speak about the supreme being, you'll see that masonry speaks about the supreme being. And you'll hear Hinduism speak about the supreme being. Now as the catechumen on the ground we would assume that would be God but the insider language teaches us and tells us that the supreme being of Freemasonry is Lucifer is it possible that somehow the supreme being of of Hinduism can also be Lucifer well I'm not sure let's go and check Let's go back to the source of all sources of the occult world, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. She says in Isis Unveiled that the Isis of the Hindus is called mother of an incarnated God, the mother of Krishna, virgin most chaste, virgin Trigana, virgin the celestial light and the queen of heaven. Does this sound familiar? Does it somehow sound similar to the Queen or the Virgin Mary or the Mother of God, the Queen of Heaven? What Hindus are worshipping, unbeknown to the members, is the same as what Isis was in the ancient pagan religions. This is the Queen of Heaven, the female version of the male Lucifer. 
If we go back into the Hindu books and we have a look at the infinite grace of images, the spirit of modern India explains that a Hindu Ishavara, which is their supreme God, is not a jealous God because all gods are aspects of him. This is a bit of a challenge because it cannot be the biblical God because the biblical God says in Exodus three, uh, 34 verse 14 that thou shalt not worship no other God for I am a jealous God. If the biblical God is a jealous God and the Hindu God says he's not a jealous God, well, how many forces are there in the world? The way I understand it, there's only two, good and evil. Good in the form of God, Jesus Christ, can only come in the form of God. Evil, however, can come in the form of good and evil. So here, where he says, I'm not a jealous God, this God of the Hindus, we just have to look a bit further and go back into Hindu wisdom and have a look. It says, Lord Shiva, he is the totality of existence, male and female, light and dark, creation and destruction. Shiva is shown in various ways. Shiva, another well-known name, is Yogi Raja, i.e. the Lord of Yoga. If you wanted to know if there's anything wrong with yoga, you just got to look at who the God of yoga is or the Lord of yoga. Who is it? Well, let's ask Anton LaVey, who is the head of the Church of Satan, or was at least. He says, there is no contradiction here, for Set is the Egyptian devil and Shiva is the Indian God of destruction. Both names, Set and Shiva, are also listed in the Satanic Bible as another name for Satan. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky says, now we have but to remember that Shiva or Siva and the Palestinian Baal or Moloch and Saturn are identical. This is sun worship. The Hindus are involved in a form of sun worship which has been marketed slightly differently to what the rest are. Shiva is just another word for Satan, according to their own documentation. What about Alice A. Bailey who founded the Lucifer Publishing Company or the, what's now known as the Lucis Trust? She says, the eye of God is Shiva or Siva. The destroyer. Remember, Shiva is the Indian god who is the equivalent of Osiris. Shiva is also a synonym for Satan. These people, as much as they might be doing what feels right, as much as they might be doing what the best that they can do, he's deceiving the whole world into following the beast. Here's an image of Suraya. In Hinduism, Suraya or Suraya is the chief solar deity. You see the sun behind? He has hair and arms of gold. His chariot is pulled by seven horses which represent the seven chakras. Suraya Namaskara or the sun salutation is a well-known Hindu mode of worship in the devotional movements of Suraya is done at the rising of the sun. Shaivites and Vaishnavas often regard Suraya as an aspect of Shiva and Vishnu respectively. Who is God? Is it Shiva? Well, no, it's not the biblical God. You'll also see from their own uh, books, the gods and goddesses of India, that one of the Hindu symbols is the swastika. Supposedly it means it is good or good morning. It shows the circular movement at the cardinal points of sunrise, sunset, midnight, the supposed spinning symbol of the sun. That's where it gets its legs from, the bent legs, as it spins either in the male form or spins the other way around in the, in the female form. The saffron swastika explains, indeed the swastika is an obvious symbol of cosmic cyclicity, hence of endlessness or eternity. It suggests that the world would never be started and will never end, and that every cycle is preceded and followed by more cycles. For Jains, it is more than for the Hindus and for the Buddhists, the swastika is part of their identity. A hand with a swastika on it is the official symbol of Jainism. So not only for Hindus, but for Jains as well, the swastika, the sun of the symbol, or the symbol of the sun, the, the spinning cyclicity of eternity that the world never started and will never end. There was no creation and there will be no judgment. That is the symbol that they worship under. These are some of the sacred symbols of Hinduism. On top you'll see that's what's called the Aum, the sound that you would make when you meditate. On top you'll see the Baal Hadad. And you'll see also the symbols of the sun in the form of the swastika. So where's the finger of the papacy or of Rome inside Hinduism or inside uh, pagan type religions? 
Well, here's an image for you to look at. This is an image of Pope John Paul II receiving the Shiva mark on his forehead as a priestess of that pagan religion plants this Shiva mark on his forehead. Why, as a supposed Christian, does he not freak out? Well, because it's the same thing. Shiva being another name for Lucifer. Lucifer being in the format, the, in the male format, a, an equivalent of Mary in the female format. We've covered Christianity, we've covered Islam, we've covered Hinduism. What about Buddhism? Is there some link to Rome or sun worship inside Buddhism? Well, interestingly enough, this quotation is taken from Hindu wisdom. But let's read it. This is about the god Ganesha, which is the supposed elephant god with many arms and this elephant head. He's called the Lord of the Beginnings. Lord Ganesha, popularly known and easily recognized as the elephant god, is one of the most important deities of the Hindu pantheon or pantheon. Lord Ganesha is the son of the Lord who? Shiva and the goddess Parvati. He is also known as the Ganesha Buddha in Japan. So the Ganesha Buddha is the same as the, the son of the Lord Shiva. As a Christian, do I want to be associated to Shiva or the son of the Lord Shiva, who's just another word for Set or Satan? No. The Buddhists, unbeknown to them, are involved in the same thing. This is just a different marketing plan which Lucifer has set up to channel worship through to him. This article continues and it says, In the Tibetan Buddhism, the practice associated with Ganesha as a Buddhist tantric deity survives up to this day. In Greece, Janus, the god in Greek mythology, has a head of an elephant. Sometimes he's depicted as the two-headed deity. So in Tibetan Buddhism, they're worshipping the same god as in, in Hinduism. Isn't that interesting? And we... We look back in history and open the history books and we'll see that Buddhists have seen or seen the footprint of their God as he walked through the earth. There was a time when he had not been anthropomorphized yet or made into a human being. But when he walked, he left a footprint in the sand or in the ground. And this image has been drawn as follows. As you'll see underneath the ball of his foot is the symbol of the sun. Under the heel of his foot is another symbol of the sun. And under each toe is the swastika. This is the sun god walking on earth and hasn't been anthropomorphized into that little statue as you see him in the Buddhist temples and in the Buddhist homes. This is the sun god walking on earth, leaving his footprint of the sun god underneath him as he walked. Okay, well that's Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. But what about Judaism? How on earth does Rome link to Judaism? Well, remembering that Rome, in fact, internally is a sun worship religion, all we have to do is go back to the sun worship temples of ancient times. As you look up towards the ceiling, there's an interesting pattern that you see on the ceiling. And as you zoom in, it becomes clearer and clearer. This is, in fact, the six-pointed star, as what we now today know as the Star of David. This, in fact, is not a star of David. This is a symbol of sun worship that comes from ancient times. Even on the building outside the temple or on the temple itself of Freemasonry in Israel, you'll see the symbol of Freemasonry as we've previously discussed. This is the compass and the set square. Now, were you to add in two lines on the compass and set square, you'll see that the two put together create the star of David. Just like Freemasonry is a fulfillment of sun worship, so Judaism on the esoteric secret inner circle is a fulfillment of sun worship. J.S.M. Ward explains that with the point upwards, the equilateral triangle stands for Shiva, the destroyer. The symbol is familiar to us, in other words, the Masons, in several degrees, noticeably the 30th degree. This triangle which you see the all-seeing eye inside, that points towards Shiva in the point up. That's one of the male or female forms of the system. The Star of David is the Shiva and the male and female joined together. Let's go back for a moment back into Hinduism and let's have a look at the symbol for Suraya. I showed you the picture of Suraya. Well, this is a symbol of Suraya. 
you'll see that each one of those is a mini star of David joining up to be a larger star of David. What about the New Age movement? Right inside the top esoteric circles where they understand and know that they worship and acknowledge Lucifer as God. There they have on the outside the circle. You'll see on top the, the sexadecimal uh, triangle, the 60 degree, 60 degree, 60 degree triangle with the eye of Lucifer inside. And you'll see it says Father and then the, it's shining down onto the 666, the Son. This is the eye of God looking down onto His Son. As we go in, you'll see the pointed star, the five, the pentagram with a point down representing the goat of Mendes. Inside that, you've got the pentagram with the point up showing the male version or the female version of the same deity. And then right in the center, is there something that you can see there? The core principle of this 666 Lucifer symbol is the star of David. Not because it's of any association to the, the Jewish religion, but it's the symbol that they've used throughout history for any association to the worship of Lucifer. Even Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, in her system called the Theosophical Society, which says Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior, her symbol, her emblem is the snake eating its own tail, and right in the center is the supposed Star of David. When you go to tarot binding and you look at, at the uh, symbols involved in the New Age movement or in, involved in putting out these tarot cards, on the tarot card binding you'll see the Star of David. The Star of David has got nothing to do with Judaism. It is a symbol of sun worship. It is a stamp of approval that Satan has placed on Judaism because a while ago he blocked them as a nation from understanding the prophecies of Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27. We've covered this in a previous lecture and if you don't know what I'm speaking about, please go and look at the lecture entitled, Who is God? It'll explain to you that there's a certain curse placed on people that read this section of the Bible. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky herself, she says, the six-pointed star, which we now today know as the Star of David, refers to the six forces or powers of nature, the six planes, principles, etc., etc. All these, the upper and the lower hierarchies included, emanate from the heavenly or celestial virgin, the great mother in all religions, the androgen, the sephira Adam Kadmon. This is by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky herself explaining that the truth around the secret inner circles of Judaism is actually to do with sun worship. And that's why when Pope John Paul or any of the popes today for that matter were to go to Israel, they would bow down at the wall as this image shows. Here's the Pope bowing down and worshipping at the Western wall. Why? Because Judaism inside is the same as Catholicism on the inside. And today, Jesus is calling the Jewish nation to come to him. Don't wait for another Messiah. The Messiah has arrived, has come, and has died for you. It says in Revelation twenty two sixteen, I am Jesus, the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. No one else. Don't wait for some future Messiah. There is a Messiah coming. He's called the Maitreya. He's called the Cosmic Christ. He's called the New Age Christ. But that's not the true Messiah. That's the impersonation of the true Messiah. Right at the beginning of this lecture, we started out by looking at adherence.com. Who belongs to what religion? How many people belong where? And we saw that 33% of Christianity belong, or of the population belong to Christianity. Has this secret infiltration happened in Christianity? Absolutely. We can black that out. Has the secret infiltration of sun worship infiltrated Islamic worship or Islam? Absolutely. What about uh, Hinduism? Is that some form of sun worship? What about Buddhism? Is that some form of sun worship? The Chinese, if you go to China, you'll see the Eastern religions are involved in sun worship. I don't have time to go into that in this lecture. But at the same time, we can just see within them the, the worships of the dragons and these dragon festivals, they're involved in sun worship. The non-religious, the agnostics, the people that say, well, there is no God or the, no deity at all, he's got them as well. The primordial and the South African or African belief of the spirits that will help you channel will 
are they involved in Jesus Christ being the mediator between man and, and God or are their ancestors? Does, does Satan have them? Absolutely. There is one mediator between man and God and that is Christ Jesus. Look again at the graphic and ask yourself, is the Bible accurate when it says the whole world follows the beast? Yes, it is. You see, BBC on the 2nd of April 2005 said the Pope was the only one to be a world evangelist. He could visit all faiths, Islam and Judaism. He prepared the way for a religious new world order. And then on the 20th of February 2006, this article was issued, Respect for Religion Urgent. Mutual respect is, is urgent between the religions. It's urgently needed. And then there was this little piece at the bottom that said, in the current international context, the Catholic Church remains convinced that to encourage peace and understanding between peoples and individuals, it is necessary and urgent that religion, now listen, that religions and their symbols be respected. Why would the Pope call for religions and their symbols to be respected? Well, the whole world follows the beast. Christians, Islams, Hindus, Buddhists, all of them are following and there's going to come a time when he's going to claim responsibility. In Christianity, he's calling his children together, his daughters. And all the other religions he's starting to call together as well. It's called ecumenism or ecumena, one unity, but it's unity in error. It's unity towards the East in sun worship. And then mind-blowing of all mind-blowings, I believe, was an, an image I received on Time magazine 27th of November, 2006. Here is the Pope himself, Pope Benedict, with a hint of a leaning forward as he bows down to the symbol of Islam on the cover of Time magazine. These people know what they're doing. The Pope bowing down to the symbol of the star with the, with the, the, the sun with the crescent moon doesn't matter if he bows down to the symbol of Islam or if he bows down to the Eucharist. It's exactly the same thing. Revelation 13 verses 2 to 4 says, And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. And all the world wandered after the beast and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast. But then in Revelation 18 verse 1 to 5 it says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. For all nations, not just northern Zimbabwe or south England, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. Whether you belong to the Christian faith, or the Islamic faith, or the Hindu faith, the Buddhists, the Jews, wherever you find yourself as an agnostic, as a humanist, Jesus Christ is calling you out of a false system of religion. There have been various marketing plans that have been set up by Satan, and he's deceiving mankind into believing that they are true. Jesus Christ says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. The whole Old Testament is calling the Jewish nation. Thank you for joining me on this journey. And I hope to, to be able to share the next bit of information with you as we expand this even more. <music>